in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Black Junior Golf Podcast. I'm your host, Ro Thompson. Uh, man, we got a special guest tonight. Uh, man, we're going to treat you all with one of our junior golf uh, pro protégés. She's doing some amazing things at Howard University. And um, we can't, I can't wait to get her on the platform. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say um, hats off to all our juniors that's playing um, <clears throat> in some really big tournaments. We had uh, Awesome Burnett that just played in the uh, Nota Begay uh, tournament. And I think that's going to be aired um, in the next week or two. I got it on my calendar. I can't remember the exact date, but that's going to be airing uh, real soon. And, um, and we got some other juniors that's doing some amazing things and really stepping up to the plate. And so tonight, you all, we're going to focus on Miss Kendall Jackson from, um, from the big state of Texas. So let me bring her in. So good evening, Kendall. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm uh, doing great. It's good to have you on the, the podcast tonight. I've been, um, I've been watching your live on Friday night, and um, I've really enjoyed uh, <clears throat> the commentary and the things that you're able to share with the classes and the golf and the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the class, you know, the, you know, just the campus life and <clears throat> the whole nine. So, so how you doing? How you doing so far? Are you ready to enjoy your Thanksgiving break? Absolutely. I'm ready to head home, be back in the warm weather because yesterday it was like 27 degrees out or no, it was like 30 something feeling like 27 I was like, no, take me back home to my seventy degree weather. So you ready to you ready to head back now? What's the, so it's, it's seventy degrees in Texas right now? I have to double check. It was I think it was raining either today or tomorrow. Okay, but yeah, usually our highs in December, upper sixties, lower seventies. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, listen, um, before before we get into a lot of the Q and A tonight, um, tell us about Kendall Jackson. Yes, so I'm Kendall Jackson, born in, born in Houston, but raised in a suburb of Houston called Pearland. I was there all the way from kindergarten all the way up until high school graduation. And I first was introduced to the game of golf from my dad. He, he started me at the first tee of Greater Houston. Um, and at first, I really did not like golf that much. See, this was 2009, so I just turned six. I was very young, still kind of deciding what I like to do, what I don't like to do. And I enjoyed first tee as a whole, but the game of golf itself, I found kind of slow and kind of boring. But once I kind of stuck with it and realized the potential skill I could have, um, from there, we started taking lessons, started getting into tournaments. Um, I played my first ever 18-hole tournament March 17th, 2015 um, at Bay Oaks Country Club, not too far from my house, and shot a whopping 124. Anything and everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. My bag broke that day. I was losing golf balls left to right. It was, it was a hot mess for sure. But from there, my parents and I truly reevaluated, okay, if this is what we're going to do, let's do it the right way. Let's kind of retrace our steps. So this was 2015. For the rest of that summer, we started playing nine-hole tournaments. So that way I could get used to playing a uh, competition. But everybody knows when it comes to all sports, there's practice time and then there's like game time, game mode, whenever uh, like you have to make this putt or else or whatnot. So I played uh, more nine hole tournaments and then the next summer we did more nine holes and then started playing more 18 hole tournaments because we knew I was going to be going to high school soon. And then my freshman year, so I went to Pearland High School, was definitely an adjustment because I mean, golf is an individual sport. And when you introduce that team aspect, it's like, man, you can't get down on yourself and have a bad day because that brings the whole team down. So those first few months and then especially since we had to take the bus to practice. So I have like my golf clubs. I have my backpack. I have my lunch. I have my change of clothes. Ooh, that was that was I was like, I cannot wait to drive. So I don't have to worry about handling all this stuff. That's right. But those first, those first few weeks, first few months were for sure just I definitely saw a dip in my scores. But then once I found a routine and got into my rhythm, I enjoyed it from there. I remember because we, we go district, regional, and state. District, I played well, but I knew that I had the potential to play better as long as I really, it was more of a mindset thing because physically I had the capability, but mentally I really had to prepare more. So I remember the weeks leading up, it was like nothing but like this positivity and motivation, not just for myself, but for my team as well. And at districts, I was able to shoot 76, 77, which nice. at the time, which, I, it was, yeah, very good as a freshman, but at the time, I did not realize what state was all about. Oh, actually, let me backtrack real quick. December of that following year, 
I played at Legacy Hills in Georgetown, Texas, okay. and I played very well. I almost ended up winning the whole thing, but I think I kind of, I got distracted on the last few holes, ended up having to go into the playoff and ended up losing the tournament. And I was so upset, so frustrated. And my dad was like, hey, you know, this is where they play the state course, right? And I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to be back. I'm going to be back. <laughs> not, not realizing a couple months later what he actually meant. So at regionals, I shot 76, 77, and right. I was fifth overall. Mm -hmm. And in order to advance the state, it's top three teams and top five individuals. And I mean, I'm one, two, three, four, five. And so next to my name, it said SQ. I'm like, SQ, I wonder what that means. And then state qualifying. Like, I just qualified for state. That's so, right. good. so I became the first person ever, male or female, to ever qualify for state. Um, from Pearland High School, and that experience was amazing. I ended up having a surprise um, send off. Uh, what was it called? Send off parade, little pep rally. And yeah, again, I mean, the rally. way they played it off too. I was like going to the nurse. They had me go to the nurse's office to grab a few things, and I'm looking at. I'm like, oh, I wonder what they're doing because at first I saw the cheerleaders. I'm like, this is May. They're still not in season. And then I saw a little sign that says, "Good luck." I'm like, oh, that's so nice. I wonder who's up for it. Said, "Good luck at state." I'm like, oh, who's going to state? Good luck at state. And I'm like, oh wow, that's for me. So <laughs> Good. that was incredible. Now let me ask you. Did you, yes. did you grow up, did you grow any other, did you play any other sports growing up besides golf? I did. I actually introduced uh, karate before I started golf because I was like my summer camp as well as after school. So I actually ended up earning my black belt as well as my first degree black belt at age 12 and age 13, I believe. Yes. Good. And then I did basketball in seventh and eighth grade. Seventh grade, I was absolutely terrible. I thought I was Steph Curry shooting those threes. From half court. Oh no, 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 gotcha. no. So eighth grade, I just stuck to layups and I was good from there. Now question for you. Um, yes. why do you like playing golf? Why do I like playing golf? Yes. At first, when I was younger, it was more like, wow, I can really hit the ball really far. I like this. This is cool. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older, I realized there's just so much opportunity through the sport, not yeah. only just like at the local level, but just beyond that, beyond college, beyond professional, just so many connections. I've been able, I mean, I'm only 19 years old. I've only been playing competitively since 2015, but the amount of people, not amount of people, the types of people I've been able to meet, the right. types of courses I've been able to play just from all over the country. It's truly a sport that can take in places you would never think uh, would be possible. That's right. That's right. So let me ask you this, Kendall. What, what do you feel that you have done in the last couple of years, because I've seen you, you know, I talked to um, your dad, you know, all the time. And, you know, we, we've talked about some of the struggles. Um, what do you feel that you did personally to take your game to another level? Because if, if something happened that caused you to take that next leap, what, what, what do you attribute that to? Definitely the mental side and just naturally growing up and maturing. Because I, I've actually recently started journaling. I started journaling May of last year. Uh, I think I heard it from, I think I ended up hearing it on the reel. I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. I can start journaling. And to just see my progress from like this year to last, it's really just a matter of like, okay, if you're going to do this. You have to do it on your own. Not doing it on You really have to set goals for yourself. And like, okay, if this is what we're trying to do, let's actually put this work in and go there as well as getting advice from other people, other people either um, at the time for me, so like eighth grade, asking people who were in high school, asking people in college, asking people beyond, asking the right people. And at the same time, just really researching, learning all that you can do. I mean, obviously following Tiger Woods' story and his whole mental aspect from there, but definitely just natural maturity, naturally just getting older and just learning and experiencing more. Experience, I for sure would say is the number one lesson because even though you do not win every golf tournament you right. do not have your best day every single day oh yes I would say that um being able to take a bad day right. and not just sulk in it and just be able to take good from it so that's why I keep reminding myself like on days I have bad days I'm like okay Lord I don't know why you allowed this to happen but this is going to help me one right. way or another if not tomorrow then maybe a year from now this is going to help me some way yes yes and and, and so you know Talk about, talk about Kendall, the, the work ethic. You know, one of the things that I've noticed, and I don't know, I don't know if your parents make you go practice or if it's self-motivation. Um, talk about, talk a little bit about the self-motivation that it takes 
to put the work in so you can get better. Talk to us a little bit about that. I can do both high school and college aspect because it, it's definitely had to adjust now being over here. But from a high school aspect, definitely once I qualify for state that first time and realize, wow, this is like this can be a regular. It is a matter of um, kind of sacrificing like at times where I knew where I want to go here, go there. Like, no, you need to go to practice, but not so much of it's a, I have to force myself. It's like if you're trying to get to the next level, if you're trying to get better, you have to do what you have to do. Um, cause sophomore year, I did not qualify junior year was canceled. So senior year, I definitely was like the most motivated I've ever been because yeah. I knew like, this was like, this is your last year. You have, there's not, nothing other beyond that. Um, so really just absolute laser focus. My mom and I, we came up with a thing, we came up with it, uh, freshman year, uh, state focused instead of state focused, state focused. So being able to create a little acronyms here and there, just stuff um, to keep you motivated. So senior year, I definitely closed out with one of like the best I've ever played. So freshman year, I went 77, 76. Senior year at a different course, I went 74, 67. I went one under on the front, four under, just absolute laser focus. It was unreal. I, I mean, I that was just that was I still talk about it. I'm like, oh my goodness, that was that was crazy. That was the 67. Is that your lowest tournament round ever? Yes, the previous week, actually, that whole week leading up to regionals, I knew it was bound to happen because I actually shot my best score previously, which was a 68 at that same course. I said, we are keeping this same energy into yes. next week. Good. Able to now, what's your, now, what's your lowest round ever? 67, that 67. day at regionals. Nice. I, I know that had to be a really good feeling. Especially, what was really funny, I'll talk about this shortly, I'll be done, because um, I started the day birdie birdie, I was like, okay, and then ended up giving it back by uh, three putting on the next few holes, I was like, no, we cannot get upset, and so then that ninth hole, it was a par five, had a great approach, only one sixty-seven out, hit a nice six time to like five feet for eagle, I missed the putt, I was like, what? But I did not let it upset me because I knew, as I said, as long as I can go one under on the front, I know it can be fine. And then just have that absolute, like, this is not going to be your last nine holes. You got this. You can do this. Let's, like, just constantly motivating, motivating, motivating. And it was just, I went par birdie, er, par, par birdie, par, par birdie, par birdie, birdie to close out. I think that was right. Something like that. Yeah, you, you that was a great, great, great round. So now we, we talked about the good rounds. Uh, what do you what do you tell yourself when you're having a bad stretch of holes? You know, you may not play the whole round bad, but you may go through like a, a three putt, you know, hole. You may have a penalty hole. Talk about how you settle yourself when you're actually playing not the best during a during a round. I'm still working on that for sure, but the things I've used in the past, I came up with an acronym actually for regionals that I still have to keep on using now. CFP, calm, focus, and positive, because it goes both ways, both when I'm playing. Because everybody knows when you're playing good, it's very easy to get distracted. At the same time, using it to keep motivating yourself when you're not playing as well. So I try to think about that. I'll be like, CFP, come on, come on. CFP, calm, focus, positive. And then depending on the shot, if I've tried to laugh it off, like if it was like just like a chunk or wait, I was like, come on, man. And just try to laugh it off and just try to let it go. Because I know in the past I've had a chance of like just like keeping it in like, no, that shot is over. You got to move on to the next. So really emphasizing that and uh, focusing on that. Um, yeah, trying to laugh it off, the acronym. And then as well as seeing what went wrong, but being able to take it and use it as motivation. Like, OK, we'll see what happens. Not don't do that again. I like, don't have that negative thinking, but I'm like, okay, we know what to do. Let's let's just let's do it. Exactly. That's good, Kendall. Because you got to stay calm. You got to stay focused. You know, because it's so easy to get off track on on the golf course. Now, Kendall, tell us about some of your favorite LPGA players. Some of your favorite PGA players. Who are some of your favorites? Yes, so I was actually able to go out to Dow Great Lakes Bay Invitational and played in the Pro-Am, so I got to meet a ton of the ladies on tour to meet uh, Stacey Lewis, Lexi Thompson, the Porter Sisters, uh, Cheyenne Woods, uh, Shaw Avery Hart, I believe, wasn't there, but she actually follows me now, which is amazing. She's such a huge inspiration. I was able to uh, watch her uh, watch her story on the John Chippen Invitational, so she's definitely one of my favorites. 
or I believe it's her, Shine Woods, Alexis Belton, and a few others are doing stuff um, to motivate, not only motivate more African-Americans into the game, but being able to help those who are trying to get to that tour level. So I was like, oh, I hope she's still doing that when I come up, because that would be amazing. They're a huge inspiration. Um, so far as PGA Tour players, I mean, Tiger Woods is always, always a favorite for sure. Um, I still go back and look at his stuff, but so far as right now, Cameron Champ, of course, not only because of Matt Camp, but just because of just an amazing human being that he is, as well as a uh, phenomenal golfer. Xander, and then so far, just like strictly like technique wise, Xander Shoffley and yeah. Colin Morikawa, their tempos on their swings is just absolutely amazing. And Colin Morikawa has been killing it recently, considering how young he is. I call, him, been- a, I call him a killer. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Him and Shoffley both. I actually stayed up watching Shoffley win the gold medal. It was yeah, like two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I got nothing else better do. Let's let's watch a little golf. So that's right. great. There you go. Um, for sure. Now, what is now what are some of your favorite courses around the country? I know you had a plan, had a chance to play a lot. And so, what what are your favorite courses? You know, from the East Coast to the West Coast. Starting, I gotta gotta start with Texas. Uh, River Oaks is definitely one of the nicest courses, one of my favorite courses I've ever played. Not just because of the huge houses you see at Christmas time and all the Christmas lights. That course was, considering how flat Houston is, that course was extremely hilly. Like, you have all of Houston skyline just flat. And then you have this course that's like this. That's definitely one of my favorites. Um, Let's see. Another favorite is Shoal Creek in Kansas City, Missouri. Mainly because of the memory attached. That was the first time my family from Kansas City got to see me play. And ended up being a phenomenal tournament. It was a very nice course. But that's more so for, like, I just, like, one of the best just golf tournaments ever. So far as going up to the, oh, I got to go this way. West Coast, I actually got to play the Stanford golf course that they practice at because I was there for camp. That was yep. a very nice course, very nice course for sure. Um, and then East Coast-wise, Columbia Country Club, that's where I was for the U.S. Girls Junior. Absolutely stunning. That was in, um, Mar- that was in Maryland, right? Uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland, yes. That's but right. so far, my most favorite course, which is actually my most recent course, a Lotion Golf Club in Rowan, Arkansas where they hosted the um, inaugural Jackson T. Stevens Cup. That okay. course is as if Augusta National was carved out of a mountain. <laughs> really? And I tell you, yes, every single shot was just picturesque, especially on the black nine looking over Lake Maumel. Yeah. My good, but that course, went, it was so it was hilly tough. that we were in, it, it, we were in carts all, all the duration of the tournament. Practice yeah. round all the way up. I believe I got over 30,000 steps just from the cart. Just from the cart. Wow. Just from the cart. That, so, I think, takes, that course definitely tastes the cake, for sure. Uh, a lotion golf club. All right. Now, let's talk about your college experience. This is your, this is your freshman year in college, you know, first fall semester. Tell us, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how you're enjoying it. Talk about some of the good, some of the bad. I know you miss home. I know you miss mama's cooking. You know, <laughs> talk, talk, talk to us about the college experience. Yes. Well, first of all, the first few weeks were hot. I was like, I did left Houston for the heat. I'm not trying to bring the heat with me. Definitely right. those first few weeks was adjustment, especially I'm from Houston, but I'm from Pearland. I'm from the suburbs. I'm from the white suburbs. So coming from the white suburbs to a black city, I was like, I've never seen this many black people in my entire life. Oh my goodness gracious. And then two playing golf. I mean, I've never been a part of the majority. So that was just the first thing. Like, I'm like, this is my people, but this is still a major culture shock. That was definitely the first thing. Um, The second thing, not having my car. I don't drive that much. I never drive in Houston. If I do, it's the beltway around. I'm never in Houston driving. Right. Not having um, constant mode of transportation. Not necessarily just to practice, but just like, wow, like, I, I don't have my car. Like, I guess I'm supposed to walk. I'm supposed to take an Uber, catch a ride. That's definitely an adjustment when you're used to, oh, parking lots. These people don't believe in parking lots. I was like, the parking here is just non-existent. But that's more of the city aspect. From the college aspect, um, Howard, there's actually not that many people from the Northeast there from all over. I actually joined Texas Club here at Howard, which is amazing. A lot of people from Houston, a lot of people from Texas. So that's definitely been my number one uh, great experience is just meeting different people from all over the country, really all across the globe, too, and just making lifelong friendships, because that's the biggest thing I've heard. I was like, I've always always like to ask people, like, how do you enjoy college or some of your favorite memories about college? And the biggest thing they emphasize is that's where you make your lifelong friends. 
So just not only having the team as well, which I know we're going to be close forever, but being able to meet people in school of business, meet a couple of people in my classes, or even just like on my floor in my dorm, just being able to make those connections I know are going to last forever. Um, exercising has been, because uh, I've always exercised, but I've always haven't been uh, consistent with it. At first, we were going Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, 6 a.m. in the morning. And the, the gym we go to is a good 10, 10, 12 minute walk up two very major steep. That's what they don't tell you at Howard. Howard is hilly. It doesn't look that hilly in the photos. It's a little hilly coming from everywhere that's flat. Right. Um, so I, I've truly enjoyed that, being able to work with the trainer, being able to exercise with the team, as well as doing a little bit on my own in the gym as well. Um, classes, I can't really speak for classes considering, unfortunately, they're for me this semester, all my classes were online except for business orientation. So that, I mean, yes, good, you want to stay safe, but I kind of miss that aspect of like being able to connect with like my professors, connect with uh, my fellow students. But I've been able to make a few friendships from there. School of Business. School, our School of Business does not play. We are in Business Conservative, which is the black suit and the white button down. Right. I want to say 90% of the time because they have uh, different companies who are both like sponsored, like partnered with our teams, as well as just different companies that come to visit. So I've truly, I mean, this is just my first semester. I've learned all about like, interviewing, internships, uh, having the correct resume, which is actually, I still need to work on my resume because all my resume is just on my golf stuff. Golf resume. But now, yes, but now being able to transition into that professional space um, which is definitely an adjustment especially since I do play golf and I am trying to play not trying to I will be a professional um, in a few years for sure being able to gotta speak it right gotta speak it <laughs> yes for sure being able to just like okay what do you like to do besides golf what is a career you would not mind pursuing if it wasn't golf so I'm like oh I actually need to sit here and think about it because I mean you actually have to have a career for sure or not a career but at least have to have a degree before I pursue it for sure Gotcha. And you had a chance to meet um, Steph Curry, right? Not yet. Not yet. It's coming. We're getting though. there. We're yes. getting there. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming. So as we as we get ready to wrap up the interview, I'm going to open up the lines for some from for some Q and A. Um, how can how, how can everybody meet reach you on social media, Kendall? Yes. So I'm the most active on Instagram, which is Kendall Jackson Ten, because I recently it was Kendall Jackson underscore the one and only, but that was a little long. We had to cut back. Um, I'm on Facebook, which you just look up Kendall Jackson and you'll see. Oh, I changed my profile photo. I'm about to say, you can just see this on the profile, but okay. I changed my profile photo. Okay. Um, and then Twitter is at Kendall J Golfer, but I for sure post the most and vo- most active on Instagram. Yeah, but the great thing about social media, if you, if you connect your, your accounts, when you post on Instagram, it'll post in multiple places. So that's, that's really good. But Kendall, it's been, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm going to open up the lines of, of communication and uh, we've got a question real quick. Talk about your, um, talk about your swing coaches uh, real quick and then we'll open up the lines. Okay. Your swing coach. Yes. I'm at Axis Golf Academy, which is in Cypress, Texas. I actually just recently started there September of last year. Um, that is, I work with coach EJ Kim. He is absolutely amazing. When I like my absolute first lesson, he took exactly what I was doing, knocked it down to a T like, this is great. This is not great. This is what we need to improve on. And his whole thing is working with your body because it's not because everybody has a unique and their own natural swing, but being able, but there's just like some stuff that's like a deal breaker, um, right. but being able to use what I have and just capitalize on that is very good. Um, he is, and he tells me how it is too. At one point he was like, if you're not going to put in the work, I'm not going to work with you. I'm like, okay. And then that next week shot 68. <laughs> wow. Nice. Nice. Um, and what, what course do you uh, typically practice, uh, practice at? That's one of the questions. I'm now in that Sugar Creek Country Club in Sugarland, which I'm excited to finally be back. Um, I'm, I actually recently started there in the summer. Uh, and then also the first year, Greater Houston. That's uh, my roots for sure. But yeah, first year, Greater Houston and Sugar Creek. Okay, awesome. So Kendall, let's open up the lines of communication and uh, let's see if any, any of our listeners have any questions. You know, we are live. That's one of the great thing about our Junior Golf Podcast. We are live. So if y'all want to ask Kendall any questions, I'll go right ahead. I got a question. All right, go of right ahead. Of course you do, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> hey, of course hey, you do. Hey, talk about your uh, experience uh, at the Mac Champ Invitational. Can you touch on that? 
Yes, I can. That was March of last year. That was an incredible tournament. It was a little chilly that time of year. I mean, it was March, but I'm like, y'all could have been a little bit warmer, Houston. Um, that was incredible because, like I said, that was March of this year, Kendall. Oh, it was. We still in 2021. My bad. My bad. It was this year. Yep. Yes, that was an incredible tournament because both playing locally and all over, I'm usually, if not the only African American, not even just female, but person. Um, so being able to play with different black golfers, with people. Uh, golfers of color not just from Houston not from Texas but all across the country was amazing and then I've played Memorial quite a few times but being in like that tournament mode aspect of Memorial was incredible and just like the dinner the reception um, being able to connect with you of course in person and John and then I think I played oh yeah me Ty and Austin and Matthew had like a little putting competition so just like that uh, connection that camaraderie and then the actual tournament itself, considering this first year, everything was ran very smooth. I loved how they performed it, um, just from like the COVID protocol to the dinner afterwards, to the actual tournament itself, and then Cameron Champ having uh, the clinic afterwards. That was incredible for sure. Uh, I wish I could play it this year, at least come back, but definitely one of my favorite tournaments I've ever played in. All right, great, great, Kendall. We got a question from Sean. Go right ahead, Sean, what's your question? Hey, Kendall, how you doing? I have a quick question for you. Um, yes, sir. What, what would you say to the, to the young, young female golfers who are contemplating starting to play golf? Um, what steps would you recommend them to take in order to pick up the game and start uh, progressing to the level that you're at? Yes, for sure. Um, I guess really, too, depends on your age. But for sure, I would say just stick with it because I know those first few weeks, first few months can be a little intimidating as well as a little frustrating. But you have to have those growing pains in order to grow and definitely reach out, see if you can find somebody that you know. It's all about community. And that's one thing we kind of discovered afterwards is just like being able to have a black golf community, black uh, golf community. So that way you can like rely on people like, hey, uh, like what tournaments are you playing in? What coach are you playing in? So definitely finding community um and even just looking up youtube videos if not you, there's so many stuff on there i mean you do got to sometimes take those with a grain of salt of course but just being able to explore all that you can and just the main thing is just sticking with it because it can be frustrating at times but definitely sticking with it but so far as getting to the next level definitely playing the right tournaments playing the right tournaments locally or nationally if you have to um definitely investing in a swing coach if not locally somewhere nearby because it's hard to do it on your own. It's hard to do anything on your own, but especially golf, having those resources mentally, physically, financially, definitely all about uh, finding a community for sure. Great question. Great question. Appreciate you. All right. Next question for Kendo. Any other questions for Kendo Jackson? Hey, can you share your journey uh, about recruiting and what work, uh, what uh, advice would you give other people? who is going to be experiencing that, if not this year, next year? Yes, for sure. So for me, I was in the class of 2021, so right behind the forgotten class of 2020. And at <laughs> first, I mean, junior year is like, sweet, I'm at home, we chilling. And then when it came time for recruiting, I'm like, oh, man, we next up in line. So even though we didn't experience everything that happened in class of 2020, we were definitely in that domino effect um, because this is the summer of 20, yeah, summer of 2020. No coaches were able to come out at all and to recruit. So it's all based off, off your scores, based on how you're placing in tournaments, which at the time I definitely was not playing my best golf. I would actually play my worst golf, to be honest. Like I go back and look at my scores from like February to like May. I was like, what was going on? So that not only was just killing me mentally, but not being, or like reaching out to coaches, they're like, thanks, but no thanks, or like we're full, or we don't know how our thing is going to, how our roster is going to look because we have seniors coming back. That was definitely um, very frustrating, very, very frustrating, especially since I've been talking about since high, since freshman year of high school, that I want to play division one golf. I want to get a golf scholarship, but not having that feedback on that. And it was like, wow, I'm a very good player but I am not getting recruited. Um, so just speaking on that aspect, but just really being able to like, okay, you got to do what you got to do. Keep e That's the biggest thing. Email, 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 email. Even if it seems like it's tiring on your end, the more you can reach out um, and just, oh, and that's the thing, keeping your options open. At first I was like, I'm from the South. I'm going to stay where it's warm. 
you know, reach out to all. Now, if there's places you don't want to go, then don't reach out, of course. Now, but that's, the, just that's be, the coaches, right, Kendall? Email yes, the coaches? We, okay. Yes, for sure. But just being able to step out of your comfort zone, that's don't limit yourself. Definitely uh, explore all of your options. But so far, it's now that we're kind of loosed up with um, – now that coaches can come out, when they come out, just definitely – just feel like you're just out playing with your friends. Don't don't make it feel as a special, like, oh, I have to do well, I have to perform, because then that's when you tense up, and then that's when things go wrong. Just being able to relax. Um, definitely watch your reactions for sure, especially me. I'm still still working on that aspect, of course. <laughs> but just being able to just really have fun and truly relax whenever they do come out and watch. Good. All right, Kendall, we got a question from Darren. Go, Darren, go right ahead. Hey, good evening, Kendall. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Congratulations on, on all your success and welcome to the East Coast. Thank you so much. Um, so my question, I want to take you back to high school, particularly the early, early years. Talk to me a little bit about your practice routines and specifically sort of block verse, 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 random. And how much time really were you dedicating, you know, on a weekly basis, would you say? Yes, for sure. So for me, for high school, we practice three times a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. And then I always, um, if my Fridays weren't too busy, I was always practicing on Fridays, as well as golf was definitely dedicated on Saturdays. So really, what's that, five times a week, for sure, anywhere from four to five times a week. But everybody knows it's quality over quantity. It doesn't matter how much you practice. It matters, like, what are you getting out of that practice? So usually on a typical day, if we were playing holes, we, I was just stretching those straight to playing holes. But for like range shipping and putting, I definitely still working on this too, but definitely allocated the most time to just short game, chipping and putting, working different drills. Because I know for a majority of people, they want to head straight to the range, straight hitting into those drivers. But no, where is the majority of your scores coming from? Where are you most of the time on the course? Like how many times you hit your driver versus how many times you hit your putter? How many times you hit your three wood versus how many times you hit like your wedges? So really... Uh, being able to step back, like, okay, I know I'm hitting golf balls, but work on the short game, um, creating then I need to bring this back once I get home. Um, I forgot what it's called, but basically I start – No, you're not going to make birdie every single time, but you should not be making worse than a par inside of 120 yards, inside of 100 yards. So you keep moving, moving up, moving up. And then say you get to nine, to say you get to 80 yards and you make a bogey, then you would stay at 90 yards until you can get all the way down. So that's one game I play like whenever I'm on the course, it's not too many people. Um, another thing I'd like to do on the course, or not on the course, on the range, practicing different shots. Because for me, my go-to is always like a draw. But I'm like, you're not going to be able to have a draw for every single shot. So being able to move the ball both directions, being able to aim at different targets. Oh, I know Tiger Woods uses um, kind of like the tic-tac-toe board. So being able to hit like a low shot here, middle shot, high shot. I've still got to work on that for sure. But just having as much fun with it, being as creative as you can. Um, and then sometimes for like for chipping, Sometimes I'll stay in that one spot and won't leave that one spot until I make it in. Or I'll have like a up and down game to where I'm at like three different spots. I don't know, not three different spots. I'll, or no, you either stay in one spot or three different spots. You have to have one chip and one putt. If not, you start all over because it really implements that pressure because everybody knows uh, in tournament time, that's what kind of makes or breaks you pressure. And the more you can incorporate pressure into uh, your practice, the benefit, the more better for sure. And then either playing with people too, either playing match play, playing stroke play, having like, hey, I bet you $20, I'm gonna beat you today. Like, I bet you can't. And then having that kind of friendly competition for sure. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. The more pressure you can incorporate in practice, the more beneficial it will be in tournaments. Yeah, Kendall, I hope I answered your question. I went through Thank like you. all the way around. I went all the way around. <laughs> But, you know, Kendall, that was key what you talked about with the short game because I think for most juniors, 
you know, like you just said, they'd rather go to the range and bang balls. But, you know, the majority of your shots are going to come from your short game. That's your chipping and your putting. You, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to really get John to do is work on his 10-yard chip. It's 15 yard chip. Those numbers you don't think about are those uncomfortable numbers. Those like in the yes. team, where it's like it's not a full swing, but it's not a short swing. Like you got to, that's all about finesse right there. All about right. it. And that's, and that's the difference between him, what I see him and some of the elite juniors. They work on that, that short game, the, the putting. And so it's not just going out and putting balls, but they have, they have things set up. They may have, the, the Pelzer line, they may have the tees in the ground to make sure that putter is going back and through versus back and to the right and or back and, you see what I'm saying? And Absolutely, so, for sure. It's, it's just, I mean, it, it, it would just make a world of difference if the juniors would work on that short game and use tools and instruments to get better. What's your thoughts on that? Absolutely, for sure. And that's what I'm working on as well, incorporating more tools. One thing I use is a dub line from Coach Andy Walker. Um, definitely um, seeing where you are over the ball, making sure you're not too far over it, not too far back, watching how that club faces that impact. Um, and then so far, it's like chipping and putting, or so far as chipping, I know for sure. I used to have a net that I used to chip to, but I actually ended up donating it to Jack Yates High School. Um, I'm actually partnered, not partnered, I say that like I'm sometimes a big time company. No, I was able to connect with one of the girls there, uh, Hi- Ivy Henner, I believe, mm-hmm. um, as well as, and then I believe she's on the call too, Monty Carlos so and I, Carter, I'm kind of, I guess to call them uh, my little mentees, helping them with golf so far as like tournaments wise, so far as questions, um, because that's the biggest thing my parents have emphasized with me is just giving back, reaching out because someone first helped you. And I got to turn it on and do the same. You got to help others. You got to grow the sport. That's awesome, Kendall. All right. Any other questions for Kendall, y'all, before we wrap up? Got one more question. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mo. At what age did you feel comfortable taking in-round stats, meaning taking your own stats? Because you have a lot of junior golfers and their parents are taking the stats. When did you get become comfortable in taking stats? And then once you started taking your stats, did it help you? Great question. Great question. I would say that everybody matures differently. But for me, it was like sophomore. It was like, mm, I want to say sophomore, sophomore, junior high school. So 15, 16. Um, for me, I kept, or I keep, yeah, keep stats so far as greens hit, fairways hit, number of putts, number of up and downs, meaning one chip, one putt. Like if I chipped it, did it take me one putt, did it take me two putts? Um, that way it gives me a better focus of what I need to work on leading up to either that next term or that next week. So it's because, yes, that would happen frequently. I would be upset, like, oh, I'm upset, I'm frustrated, but what went wrong? Because you can miss, like, or not miss, um, like for me, I'd be like, oh, my driver was off. But no, you only missed uh, like two or three fairways. And even if you missed them, it was just off. No, it gives you, it dives into more specifically like what you need to work on. You're like, oh, I've um, like missed so many putts inside of this feet. Or yeah, because oh, how far were you? Were you 60 feet putting out? So it definitely breaks down what you need to work on. But at the same time, you can't let it distract you. You have to let it, you have to just know it's kind of put it on the back burner. And I think that's what happened in my last couple of tournaments so far as, uh, let me almost say in high school, but legally, I kind of let my stats distract me from how I was playing. Mm. So, I mean, I haven't played a tournament in a while. So, I'm now, I'm, like me currently, I'm on the fence, like, do I want to take stats? I now want to take stats. So, but so far, it's like, what age to start? Definitely high school. The earlier, the better, but don't let it be, become a distraction. So, so, Kendall, quick question for you. I took John's stats today. Now, because of the, the freezing cold, they – they delayed the, the tee times two hours, and then they turned it into a nine-hole tournament. So, so John had – he hit four fairways. Yeah, he hit four, four, four greens. Four to seven. Yep. Four greens? Yeah, okay. four greens out of nine greens, and he had 17 putts. So what does that tell you? You said four fairways, four greens, 17 putts? Correct. Let's see, fairways – you see nine that's seven so four to seven that's not too bad at all 
It depends on how much you miss the fairway. Because if you're just off and you still have a shot to the green, that's good. It wasn't, it wasn't that much. He um he averaged about two two to five yards off the fairway. Yeah, that's good. So far as greens, let's see, four out of nine, that's a little bit less than half. Yeah. For me, you always want to be a little bit more than half. But at the same time, if you're chipping and putting, for a short game is helping you, that is good. But I know the more greens, the better, because the more uh, shots that gives you. Yeah. And you said 17 putts? 17 putts, right. Let's see, 36, 36, 18. For me, for my, me personally, I always like, so far as for 18 holes, I always like to have in between 30 to 32 putts. So if you have 17, that's not too bad. A little bit um, high, you think? A little bit higher, but it's not, by all means, it's like, if yeah. you start dipping like 20, 21, that's like, ooh, that's, yeah, that's had, my kind of all. He had one three putt, so. That's oh, then by all means, yeah, that's, yeah. that's good for sure. Right. Sometimes, sometimes two putts can be annoying sometimes because you're like, man, I didn't make that ready putt. Right. But anytime two putt, you can always take a two putt for sure. Exactly. All right, but pretty good, considering the conditions too. That's the thing. That's the thing most people don't know about golf. There are so many factors that you got to implement so far as weather, humidity, wind, temperature, the type of golf ball, the time of day, northeast, northeast, north. South, East Coast, yeah. West Coast, like there's so many things. Yeah, and that was the thing, Kendall. It was cold. The, That's the, balls, were, the balls were cold. That's two. The um, he had on more stuff because he and had. He can't, That's the thing. Like, do I want to swing and be cold, or do I want to layer up and not be able to swing? I was oh, like, that's why it. I'll have like three small jackets instead. Yeah. Like, I'll take three small jackets instead of two big jackets i'm like i guess i guess i'm gonna be cold because i have to be able to hit the ball <laughs> right. see that's not what i'm ready for when i come back the last couple of practices it's been mid 40s lower 50s not too bad but if i come back and it's like the highest 30 i'm not ready for january <laughs> i'm not ready for january and february oh it's gonna be some snow in howard it's gonna be some snow so uh got a, a quick question for sean go right ahead sean hey kendall sorry one last question uh, this is Sean. Um, can you talk about uh, can, when you're practicing and um, how it translates to the course as far as knowing carry distances? You know yeah. how some people some people hit a, a seven nine and say, "Oh, I hit a seven nine, 170 yards," but they only hit at 150 and they rolled out the 120. I mean, rolled out the other 20 yards. Can you talk about that uh, for the young golfers understanding carry distances? and how that plays into effect with their game um, on the course? That is a fantastic question, because that's one aspect of my game that I've definitely had to focus on more since I've gotten a lot stronger. Like, say, for example, my five iron, I can hit it 200 yards, but is that carry distance 180? Is it 190? And that's a big aspect when it comes to going into the pins, having that front pin position. Or, for example, having the front pin position, do you want to take a club? where if you have to hit it as hard as you can, it'll carry there. You know, you have to be able to adjust um, that for sure. You have to use something that's going to help track like on the range. Then that's when you would need to spend a lot of time on the range saying, okay, don't pay attention to the rollout number because it can roll forever. It can stop. If you're playing like super muddy, wet course, you can just sit and plug. That's definitely something you need to track so far as like with, with machine, either like at top, not top. Well, yeah, top. Mm, I guess top golf or like uh, track man or whatnot. <laughs> Um, but that's, that's, that can become difficult to, that's definitely like that next level of awareness, because for me playing in Arkansas last month, um, with those greens being extremely firm, extremely hard, I'm carrying it that distance, but then it's rolling out. I'm like, well, then that's when you know you need to adjust back or say, if you're playing a course that just finished raining the last week, you're not going to get a ton of raw. So you need something that's going to carry to that exact number. Um, I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but basically that is definitely Kendall, this, yeah. is, this is good because I'm listening because I'm, I, I, you know, most of the parents, they need to learn for their, you know, to, so they can be able to tell their kids. So this is really good. So yes, it definitely depends on the course of the conditions, but when it comes, and this is something I'm working on, I'm going to say that about 20 times tonight. This is something I need to work on. Depending on where the pin is will really um, uh, dictate your carry distance. So say you have a very front pin position why shoot for the pin when you can just go for the center of the green and then putt from there? Same when it fits in that very back location. For example, if it's like that very back over water, really focus on a carry distance so far as going for pins that's going to get you on the green. 
no matter where the pin is at, get you something that's going to get you on the green to give you a chance. Um, but yeah, definitely that's something you have to track on the range. And definitely once you're on the course, see what the conditions are. Right. Then go from there. I hope that answered because I kind of went all over that the was, place. No, Kendall, that was really good. I wanted to ask you, Kendall, <laughs> what's your, how, how do you feel about aiming for the center of every green? For me, it's a matter of where the pin is. Sometimes it's not always about the center of the green, but the same level, or I can say shelf. So if you yeah. have a pin that's in the very, very back, sometimes you don't always want to be in the center of the green and have a 50 foot putt up. It's a matter of being in that same the general vicinity. So not always going for the pin, but going just right of the pin, going just left of the pin. That way, if you miss, when you miss, you'll still be in a good um, area, but definitely not always like, you got one number, you, and that's one thing that definitely has pointed out in the past for me, that I get so locked into that one number, I don't know how to deviate and like, okay, because going back to those carry distance, knowing how the ball's going to react, do you want me to hit it 140 yards and then roll out to like 145, 150? Yeah. It's a matter of, if not going for the center of the green, definitely going for just left of it, just right of it, going in the same area. Because even if you miss, say the pins on the front and you miss it five yards right, that's okay. You may not be on the green, but you're still right there in that same. You're still yeah, pin high. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Good. Kendall, this is this is really good. All right. Hey, Ro. Yes. Ro, got one more question. Go ahead, Mo. Hey, Kendall, can you talk to the parents about the advantage of playing from the forward tees Ooh. and how it helped you mentally? Oh, yes, gosh. Oh, please, please talk about that. <laughs> I, can't get, I can't get John to ever do that. <laughs> yes, playing for the four T's. Swallow your pride and play from the four T's. There is no shame. There's, I remember I used to do this at the first tee right before I left. I would only have like a couple wedges and a putter. It helps you with a lot of things. One, it helps you with scoring because that's one thing I used to struggle with in the past. I would be two or three under par and realize, oh man, I'm two or three under par and then lose focus. And the next thing you know, it's like I shoot four or five over par. So it helps you to score because if you're making par, birdie, dirty, par, par, birdie, you're like, oh, I'm used to being under, under par. It removes that pressure aspect too. It teaches you how to score within because most of the time the four tees are going to be, I mean, obviously the four tees are going to be a lot shorter. So it makes you focus more on your wedges, more on those low irons. So that way you know how to score from those short distances. That way when you play that regularly and then that's your post, like, oh, I've already done this a million times. I know how to, it sharpens that wedge game, that short game, that those low iron games. And then two, it just brings a different um, different um, perspective because, I mean, I don't play, I definitely don't play from the tips. I play more towards the back, of course, but it brings different travel, different um, views into play for sure. So if you're playing from the forward team, you're like, oh, I can take the bunker. I can take that tree versus when you play back, you're like, oh, well, let me not take that bunker. Let me not take that tree right. for sure. So it truly it truly helps you in different ways. So I've, that's something I'm definitely going to incorporate once I get back home, uh, playing from those four tees, being able to score, being able to know how to score, sharpening up that short game and those little irons, um, and then just pay, paying attention to the trouble as well. That's good. That's good, Kendall, because most, ki- most juniors, they have – like the pride thing and they won't they don't want to go to the forward tees and no shame playing from the forward tees right. they're there for a reason yeah some yeah somebody told me you know it's it's a it's a it's a thing where when you play from the four tees if you can go you know three four five under from the forward it gives you confidence to go under from the back tees too absolutely absolutely awesome all right let's get one last question for kendall and we'll wrap up the podcast thank y'all so much for being live with us tonight before thanksgiving any more questions for kendall any questions? Take, mom you have a question dad and i saw the questions mom you got one <laughs> i got one more <laughs> go ahead mo hey talk about the, the friendship and the uh that you've met with uh, bga Yes, for sure. Um, definitely the best event was the Juneteenth tournament we had in Houston, even though it was scorching hot. Oh, my goodness gracious. It was so hot. And I'm from Houston. I should be used to this, but ooh, that was that was a different kind of heat, for sure. Going back to, like, some of the Mac Champ experiences, playing with more African-American golfers, not just from Houston, not just from Texas, from all over. I've truly enjoyed, uh, and that's what goes back to what I was saying, building that community being able to like, you know, you can count on someone, phone call away, text away if you ever need anything. So far as advice or just someone to talk to, I've definitely enjoyed it. I definitely am excited. Will it be in Houston again, the the Juneteenth tournament? 
No, we're we we getting, we getting, no, we getting ready to announce that really soon, Kendall, and it's going to okay. be it's going to be epic. I'm excited. I'm ready. This is summertime. Epic. I'll be ready for sure. Hey, but hey yes. Kendall, congratulations to you and John winning the shamble. You went. You won the. I think you won the women's division, and little John won the men's division. Congratulations. Appreciate it. All right. Good job. Well, listen, y'all. Thank y'all so much for being live on the podcast with us tonight. Again, thank you, Kendall. Uh, it's been a treat to have you on. Um, uh, I want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, happy any, holidays. Any, any final thoughts before we go, Kendall? Final thoughts. Thank y'all so much for joining. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for your questions. Um, I hope I didn't ramble on too much because I know I have a tendency to ramble on. But thank y'all so much for sure. And happy Thanksgiving. Hope you eat a lot of turkey. And get a good nap because everybody knows as soon as that turkey hits, it's time to go to sleep. <laughs> That's right. And you can catch Kendall on Fridays at 8 p.m., right, Kendall? Not this Friday because somebody said they have a surprise for me, and I'm trying to get it out what that surprise is. So I won't be live this Friday. I okay. will be back. Have what is it December the third? So yeah, the first Friday in December. That sounds about um, right. It's gonna be different now because I'm gonna be at home. But yes, I usually tend to go live. Oh, I'll be back in Central Time, so it'll be 8 p.m. Central Time, uh, 9 p.m. East Coast Time or Eastern Time. All right, and Sanaya says thank you. Have a great Thanksgiving. All right, everybody, thank y'all for joining the podcast. Y'all have a good night. Everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>